Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics and in this video I'd like to discuss the government's plans to abolish the Human Rights Act and replace it with what they're calling a Bill of Rights, which of course is an allusion to a system that purports to guarantee our rights and freedoms, but in reality means that they are being weakened. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, I'm going to point out right from the start, so I've, I've obviously been checking out reliable legal opinion on this, of course I am, um, and some are saying this bill is not as bad as they first thought it was going to be. In other words, it's not necessarily as bad as some are making out. Make no mistake, it is still bad. There are still concerns in it. Uh, it is a weakening of our rights and some people are going to suffer badly as a result. It's not, however, the abolition of human rights in the UK. In fact, the rights essentially remain for the vast majority. In fact, what I'm seeing being said about this bill is, to a large extent, it doesn't change a great deal. It will be harder to enforce our human rights, mind you. Uh, that being said, there are lots of other ways in which the government are removing our rights. They've removed our right to protest a couple of months ago, for example. We could easily lose more through other means. So it may not be this bill in isolation that's a massive problem, but this bill in conjunction with other bills. But as for this bill, the government have long said that they wanted to abolish the Human Rights Act. This legislation, introduced by the last Labour government, enshrines the European Convention on Human Rights into UK law. Abolishing it doesn't stop those human rights being applicable in the UK, but it would largely cut British courts out of the picture. The government don't seem to mind the European Court of Human Rights being involved because they can attack it as a foreign court, even though it's not foreign. They can also confuse the issue with Brexit because many people do not know that this court has got nothing to do with the EU. Oh, it's got the word European. Must be the EU. No, it's not. It's a great punching bag when they need to ramp up the culture wars to distract from the serious damage they are doing to the country and its people. So they're getting rid of the Human Rights Act and they're preparing to go with this before the next election. However, especially given the low levels of trust in the government, they are planning a fiddle whereby they say they're not just getting rid of these human rights laws, they're, they're replacing them with a Bill of Rights. Evokes the Bill of Rights in America. Oh, that's good, isn't it? They've got this Bill of Rights. Which, by the way, doesn't guarantee rights at all. Even America's Bill of Rights is of limited value because judges who decide on whether there are breaches or not are politically appointed. We see daily examples of US citizens being denied the rights supposedly guaranteed in this bill. But the government's proposal for a UK Bill of Rights would be even weaker because America's version is a constitutional document. It can be changed, of course, but it would take a lot of political capital and support. A compelling argument would have to be made to the public and so on. Very, very difficult to change. The UK proposal for a Bill of Rights would just be legislation. It would be an act of Parliament that could be changed at any time. Now, in discussing this bill, I am going to be referring uh, to my first port of call on, on constitutional matters uh, uh, in a future video, David Allen Green, who's worth always checking out on these things. You know, I follow a few constitutional lawyers, but David Allen Green spends a lot of time communicating important matters to the public and does it well. I'm not going to cover him in this one, though. What I am going to reference, or who I'm going to reference, is not a legal expert, but a former rugby player. He makes the point that human rights are to protect individuals against the state. Those rights are worthless if the state can just change them as and when it pleases. And that's exactly what would happen here. It's not a Bill of Rights in the sense that it is in the United States, where it'd be very difficult to change it. This won't be easy to change as and when the government wanted to. And then you consider that it is still the government's plan to abolish independent judges and make senior judges politically appointed. So we'd have the worst of both worlds. Like when comparing to the US system, a weaker set of rights that can be changed as the wind blows and judges who will be picked to make sure that ordinary people cannot rely upon what rights might happen to exist at any one time, just like in America. You know, human rights should be a matter of cross-party support. Shouldn't it be possible to change anything related to human rights without cross-party support? Should not be for one political party that happens to be in ascendancy at any one time to determine what they are. The whole point of human rights is that they are considered undeniable, universal, common rights by all but the most extreme political activists. Yes, you may need to change them to reflect modern times, things that weren't considered, 
but it cannot be left to one group to determine how this should be done. If you cannot get wider support for human rights changes, it is clear that the changes are not in the interests of everyone. Especially when you consider that we have a first-past-the-post system. So a majority in Parliament does not reflect a majority of the public, much less, you know, voters or anything like that. This bill, if passed, could be passed by politicians representing just one-sixth of the population of the UK. And yet, the impact will be felt by all. Now, although there'll be a lot more discussion on this bill, I do want to go over my initial thoughts based on the government's summary. They published a summary before they ever published the bill. And, and this topic is bound to keep coming up as the bill passes through Parliament. So I think, as I say, I'll cover the detailed legal positions ever, uh, later because they may change. Because remember, the bill as published now is not necessarily what it'll look like as it's passed by Parliament. There may need to be changes. They may worsen it. They may do what they did with the policing bill. And actually, you know, although there's legal commentators to say, no, this isn't as bad as it could have been, they may intend to make it worse in exactly the same way they did with the policing bill. Watch out for that. But anyway, their summary. First, it states that the bill will ensure that courts don't interpret laws in ways that were never intended by Parliament. Now, here's the thing. Courts interpret laws based on what they say. If the Act does not do what Parliament intended, then Parliament made a balls up of it. But this does not occur unless you have a government of true stupidity, because we actually do have a good system for, for making sure legislation does what it intends. The House of Lords may well be in need of modernising, but it does do a good job of making sure MPs understand exactly what their bill will do. It gets plenty of expert scrutiny at several stages in its passage through Parliament. So this is a nonsense. Also imagine the situation. A senior judge deciding on a matter being tested for the first time, probably because the legislation is new. Are they supposed to go to the government and ask if they really meant what the bill says? Absolutely ludicrous. In the middle of a court case, sorry, I just need to ring the Prime Minister. Did you really mean this in your bill? Do you know that it actually says you've got to murder a puppy every second Tuesday? Did you realise that? No, you didn't intend that? Okay, fine. And, and who is to say what was intended with a bill anyway? If it's not clear to see a senior judge, an expert on the law, if they're not clear on it, how do we know that the MPs who voted for it all had the same understanding themselves? It may well have been voted by 400 MPs. Maybe they all thought it said a different thing. And what if it's legislation that was passed a long time ago and many of the MPs involved are dead? It was supposed to hold a seance to find out what they meant. This initial line is a complete nonsense. It is a pathetic excuse to be able to redefine what a law says as and when it suits their political expediency. Boris Johnson has now become so lazy that he can't even be asked to repeal laws that he doesn't like, so he's introducing one law that he thinks lets him interpret all the others as suits his political needs. A horrifying concept. And the Tories are lying about it as well. Peter Bone, a backbench Tory MP who often misleads on legal issues, is telling people it's important that British courts interpret our laws, not a European court. But they do. The European Court of Justice interprets EU law. That's it. Doesn't interpret UK law. Never has. The European Court of Human Rights interprets Council of Europe law. The Court of Session interprets Scottish law. The various high courts interpret English and Welsh and Northern Irish law as appropriate. And the UK Supreme Court interprets UK law. That is how it has been. That's how it is now. It's how it was before we left the EU. Nothing changed. But this bill wants to change it. The summary for this bill says that it wants to change it so that our courts do not interpret our laws. Say so in black and white. The second line is little better. It pretends that it's trying to save public money. This from the government that have pissed away tens of billions on nothing at all in the last couple of years and still continue to throw money at nothing. But all it actually says is that people will find more obstacles to taking legal action against the government. That's what this second paragraph says. Consider the number of successful judicial reviews that have been made against the government, especially regarding corruption under cover of COVID. We've got a lot of judgments against the government. A lot of corruption is exposed as a result of these cases. But in several of them, the government tried to argue that the plaintiffs hadn't suffered personal loss, so they shouldn't be able to bring the action. This argument didn't work because they were acting in the public interest. This second line basically says that the government will be able to block action like that in the future on the basis that the people bringing the case need to have suffered personal loss. 
So the government will move a step close to being above the law. All they have to do is silence the people who have suffered and it will be impossible to bring a court case against the government even with overwhelming evidence. That is the purpose of this. There are also some other lines that seem to be legal nonsense. You know, from the point of view of lawyers I've seen, it, it states that the UK Supreme Court will not need to pay attention to what the European Court of Human Rights says. In reality, both courts pay attention to the arguments of the other anyway. I mean, senior judges tend to listen to one another, it seems. But I don't know that anything will legally change with this. It simply gives the judges the options of discounting a judgment in the other court. But if the judges remain independent, they're not going to throw away legal arguments already made, are they? And I noticed one or two other things as well. It'll give the press more power to avoid legal action. So they'd be, they'd be um, less motivated to try and cover themselves. It makes it harder for someone to take local or national government to court over human rights failures. Other things as well. Basically, the whole thing is an absolute nightmare. You know, they'll, they'll still be able to get it through Parliament as well. Don't imagine that uh, the House of Lords will block this. It's one of the things on the infamous page 48 of their manifesto from 2019 that I tried to warn about all that time ago. It's been coming for a while. We can't look to the House of Lords to block it. It's a manifesto promise. There's an unwritten rule. They can, they can <clears throat> go back to the House of Commons and say, look, you know, there's some things in here that are a bit, no. You might want to change them. But if the government say, no, we're fine with it as it is and send it back, Parliament will, uh, House of Lords will let it through. It's the unwritten rule. Because they're not elected, they don't block manifesto promises. They can raise objections, they can suggest changes, but it'll go through. You know, so our human rights are about to become, to a certain extent, illusionary. Like I say, there's still the legal opinion at the moment that this bill doesn't change a massive amount. But what it does change is it, it makes it harder to enforce our rights. Those rights will still be there, but it'll be very difficult to enforce them. You know, and a law that's not enforced is no law at all. And don't ask what we can do about it. I and others tried to warn about it in 2019. This is the price of the failure to work together and kick the Tories out. People will say, you know, we, we should stop to fight this. We should, but not in an attempt to actually stop it. That's not likely to happen. There's two reasons why we should fight it. First, because the first step to losing is giving up. Always fight. Even when the odds seem un insurmountable, it's easier. It's actually less effort, I think, to fight and maybe win than to decide you can't win because then you'll definitely lose. But second, to try and raise the issue in the public. Get it some serious public attention, and we may not stop it. We may take some edges off it at best, but we may at least move closer to stopping this government. But the best thing we can do now is not keep making the same mistake at the next election. You know, it'll be harder to achieve because we'll have fewer rights, the government more power. I also see little sign that people are learning lessons yet. Apparently, the Tories aren't oppressive enough yet for people to actually just drop their pointless bickering. And until enough people decide that we cannot afford the Tories in government any longer, they will continue to be a serious threat. After all, how are we to persuade Tory voters that we need a new government if those opposed to the Tories aren't yet convinced? But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.